Hello everyone and welcome back to the course of compiler design. Today we are going to talk about the symbol table. So without any further ado, let's get to learning. Now if we talk about the expected outcome of the specific lecture, first we are going to see the usage of symbol table by various phases. Next we will see the various entries of the symbol table and finally we will see the operations which we can perform on the symbol table. Now in the session introduction, we have seen the compiler's internal architecture and specifically in the last session, we have gone through the brief overview of all these six phases. Now along with all these six phases, the compiler has got two more components. The first one is the symbol table manager and the next one is the error handler. Coming to symbol table manager, we have already seen it gathers all the information from the analysis phase and those gathered information are used by the synthesis phase. And the error handler works side by side with all these six phases. Now the question remains, where does the symbol table manager store all these informations which it gathers from the analysis phase, which in turn is being used by the synthesis phase? And the answer to that is the symbol table. The name is also pretty straightforward, isn't it? Since it manages the symbol table, that is why it is named as symbol table manager. Now symbol table is basically a data structure which is created and maintained by compilers in order to store information about the occurrences of various entities such as variable and function names, objects, classes, interfaces, etc. Now the information inside the symbol table is gathered from the analysis phase which in turn is used by the synthesis phase in order to generate the target code. Now let's observe how the symbol table is used by the various phases. Coming to lexical analysis, it creates the entries for identifiers. Now we already know the lexical analyzer is known as the scanner. So it scans the entire source code line by line. And during that scanning, whenever it encounters any identifier, it creates the entry for that inside the symbol table. Now coming to syntax analysis, here the syntax analyzer adds the information regarding attributes like type, scope, dimension, line of reference, line of usage, etc. Now during the semantic analysis phase, the semantic analyzer using the available information stored in the symbol table checks the semantics of the identifiers created by the lexical analysis phase and updates the symbol table accordingly. Now during the intermediate code generation phase, the available information inside the symbol table helps the intermediate code generator in adding the temporary variables information. Now in our previous session, we have already seen the intermediate code generation phase. There, we have seen in the three address code the intermediate code generator generates some new temporary variables. Now the type of the temporary variables should be precise in terms of the data it is about to store. And there, the available information inside the symbol table helps the intermediate code generator. Now during the code optimization phase, the available information stored inside the symbol table is used specifically in machine dependent optimization. Finally, the target code generator generates the target code using the address information of identifiers stored inside the symbol table. Now during the previous session, we have observed the D word PTRs, which were the data word pointers pointing to a register based pointer RBP with a specific scaling factor. Those were the addresses which helped in generation of the target code. So this is how all the six phases make use of the symbol table. Let's now observe how the different entries are stored inside the symbol table. Now since it is a table, each entry in the symbol table is associated with attributes that support the compiler in different phases. These are name, it holds the names of the identifiers, then the type attribute which stores the data types or written types of the identifiers, thereafter the attribute size, it specifies the size of the identifier. Now dimension is an interesting attribute. Many of you may know that there are one dimensional and multidimensional arrays. For those derived data types, this attribute holds their dimensions. 
However, for the primitive data types, the value stored by this attribute is zero. The next one is the line of declaration. Here, the line number of the source code where the identifier has been declared is stored. Then there is the line of usage attribute. This attribute stores the line number of the source code where the identifier has been used. Interesting fact, if the identifier has been used in the code in several instances, then all those line numbers will be stored in a linked list for every identifier entry. Finally, the address attribute stores the address information of the identifier. Now let me show you how the entries are stored inside the symbol table with the help of a proper illustration. Consider this statement. Here, the variable count is being declared. So for this particular statement, the name attribute will hold the name count. Thereafter, the type attribute will hold the type of the variable that is integer or int. Now coming to size, the size of integer depends on the platform. So if we decide that our machine which we are writing this particular statement on, has specified the size of the integer as 2 bytes. In that case, the size attribute will hold the value 2. Coming to dimension, this is the primitive data type. Therefore, for this, the dimension would be 0. Now, since we have used only this statement and we don't really have the entire source code where this statement is being used, therefore, we don't really know where this particular variable has been declared. So, for now, we are keeping it blank. Now we also don't know where this particular count will be used, so we are keeping that free for now. And the same goes for the address. Let's consider another example to understand this in a better way. Consider this statement. Here we have a character array which has been initialized with the value Neso Academy. Now since the name of the character array is x, hence the name attribute will hold the name x. Now coming to the type. This array is of character type. Therefore, the type attribute will hold the value char. Now, if we consider the size, this character array has been initialized with this entire string. Now, we know characters are of one byte. Hence, if we count the number of characters in this particular string, we will get to know about the size of this character array. So, let's do that. Now, Neso has four characters, that means four bytes. Now we will also have to consider this blank in here, so that makes it 5. And Academy is comprised of 7 characters. So altogether, we have 12 characters in here. Therefore, the size of this character array is going to be 12 bytes. Now since it is a one-dimensional character array, therefore in dimension, we will have the value 1. Now coming to these three attributes, we still cannot know anything about it right now, so that's why we are keeping these as blanks. Now, none of the attributes are of fixed size. So, it is not possible for us to know how much space should be required for the symbol table before it is actually created. So, if we choose a size which turns out to be smaller, we will be able to save the space wastage. However, we won't be able to store all the entities. On the other hand, a bigger size will lead to wastage of space. Considering these circumstances, the best solution would be dynamically allocate the size of the symbol table during compile time. Now the operations to be performed on the symbol table depends on the type of the language. In early days of programming, we had non-block structured languages. Programs written in those didn't used to have any block. Hence, those used to contain only a single instance of each variable declaration which used to have its scope throughout the entire program. Therefore, on symbol table, we could either insert the identifiers using the insert operation or access them with the help of the lookup operation. One popular example of non-block structured language is Fortran. These were discontinued, particularly because of the use of unstructured control flow using goto statements. Later on, the block structured languages like C were introduced. In C, the blocks are specified by the curly braces. For the block structured ones, variable declaration may happen multiple times within different blocks. Coming to the operations which can be performed, we have the insert and lookup operations. Additionally, we also have the set and reset operations which are used for defining and redefining the scopes of the variables which are declared multiple times. 
So in today's session, first we observe the usage of symbol table by various phases. Then we covered the entries of the symbol table. And finally, we have seen the operations which can be performed on symbol table. All right, people, that will be all for this session. In the next session, we will solve some previous year numerical problems on symbol table. So I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.